This is CJ Box, and this is the story behind my stories. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wise, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O. Brandon Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... CJ Fox. I'd like to thank some sponsors who, uh, due to their generous support of the show, help bring this to you uh, each and every time we bring you the show. Uh, from Eamon Ambrose, author of the best selling sci fi serial Zero Hour, comes a new novelette, Love and Other Algorithms. When Frank, a personal robot assistant, meets a similar model named Shelly, they are inexplicably linked and form an instant bond. But when outside forces conspire to separate them, Frank must decide how far he will go to save their relationship. However, all is not as it seems, and as Frank searches for Shelley, he learns that they are both part of something much, much bigger. Out now from Amazon Love and Other Algorithms by Eamon Ambrose. Hey authors, are you looking for a beautiful professional cover for your science fiction or fantasy book? Holly Heisey Designs offers custom illustration and cover design with characters that will put your people center stage, spaceships designed from the ground up in scenery that makes your world come alive. Visit Holly Heisey Design to book a custom cover or view pre-made ebook covers ready to purchase. Holly is an award-winning illustrator and designer who's done work for the Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction, the Future Chronicles Anthology Series, and USA Today and Amazon.com best-selling authors. Holly will bring your story world to life and get you a cover that will help sell your book. Visit hollyheiseydesign.com for more information on how to book your custom cover design or purchase pre-mades, as well as join the Holly Heisey Design Facebook group for discounts and first dibs at all the new Spaceship and Fantasy pre-made covers. Find all of this at hollyheiseydesign.com. A Bright Shore, The Eden Chronicles, Book 1 by S.M. Anderson, a military sci-fi political thriller set just a short decade from now in 2031, holding to the concept of individual liberty can get you killed. Western civilization is in collapse, a process led and driven by the world's leading supposed democracies, our own included. What was once the Western world's guiding light of liberty is quickly being replaced by state-sponsored serfdom under the guise of a global economic reset done in the name of the workers. This is an exciting new novel by an exciting new talent, uh, a debut novel, the first in a series from a a former CIA operations officer who has decided that his lifelong writing habit, hobby, obsession is more fun than real work. Uh, go pick up a copy today of A Bright Shore, The Eden Chronicles, Book One by S.M. Anderson. There's a link uh, to all of our great sponsors in the show notes at hankgarner.com. Stick around at the end of our excellent interview today for an audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. As always, thanks for listening. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Uh, today, I'm really excited to have C.J. Box on the show with me. C.J. has a brand new book called The Disappeared, a Joe Pickett novel, and I think you guys are really going to love it. Uh, welcome to the show, C.J. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm excited to have you, CJ. The new book is phenomenal. Uh, I have not been able to put it down, so uh, I'm really excited for everybody to get their hands on it. Well, I love to hear that. That's good news. Good. <laughs> yeah. uh, before we get into you know the good stuff, uh, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller? I think um, it's probably uh, eight or nine years old. I remember being, uh, I used to ride my bike to the local library in Casper, Wyoming, and I remember... Um, Going, walking through the stacks and looking um, into the bees and figuring out where my book would be someday if it was there. <laughs> and um, I didn't know at the time, wasn't thinking if it was fiction or nonfiction. It was just I wanted a book in that library. And uh, so I think that's probably when I started kind of thinking that direction. That's amazing. Uh, 
were you were you a bookish kid before that? Did you read a lot? I, I was. It was kind of unusual. I mean, I was a uh, I was a normal Wyoming kid. I you know hunted and fished and was involved in sports and stuff. But yeah, but my my dirty little secret was that I I liked to read. And, um, the librarians there would kind of keep feeding me different books, and um, I had a, my own little place in the back of the library where I'd read them and take home, and they were able to find you know, every one of the Encyclopedia Brown books for me somewhere in the state and that kind of thing. But, yeah, I always read. Wow. Uh, I grew up in the rural south, and I think uh, I, I think our upbringings were, were pretty similar. Uh, we don't have mountains. We have tall pine trees. And, uh, you know, surrounded everywhere in swamps. But, you know, I, I get that same, you know, being an outdoorsy kid, uh, but then loving uh, genre fiction, especially. Uh, what, what kinds of things did you love? Well, I, 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 like I said, the first the first series I ever remember reading was Encyclopedia Brown. I started reading kind of uh, more, you know, I, I read a lot of things. Everything I could get my hands on it was about Wyoming and the Mountain West. Um, a lot of uh, Western and historical fiction, and then just kind of branched out into, uh, you know, more sophisticated stuff before too long. I, mean, I remember I, in my early teens when I read Catch-22, I just thought that was a revelation. That was the like, best, greatest book I'd ever read and uh, really set me on a path there. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of us have that, uh, that storytelling gene, uh, and we realize at some point that it's switched on and we're going to be writers or, or you know, storytellers of some sort. Uh, but a lot of times real life gets in the way of that and you have to, you know, go, uh, find ways to pay the bills and, and all of that. Uh, w- what did you, uh, pursue as a career when you got out of school? Well, I had several, <laughs> several careers. <laughs> I had a lot of odd jobs for a while, but um, now I was a journalist. Um, my first real job was at a very small weekly newspaper in Saratoga, Wyoming, and that's where I went to out of college. And those years working um, for the, the little newspaper are still, I think, the best training ground I've ever had for, for writing books later on, um, not only because of the setting, but because it taught me to uh, write you know, write quickly, um, on deadline, and also it allowed me to do interviews with people from all walks of life. Um, and uh, I've still used a lot of those experiences from those few years of the newspapers. Um, what was the what was the first story um, that you knew you were going to write, and this was going to be a novel? Um, it, like, at what point did did journalism switch to novelist? Well, it, it was during those newspaper years. Um, at that time, uh, in Wyoming, there was uh, it, everybody was kind of searching for a, a creature that they thought was extinct, called the black-footed ferret. And there used to be posters up that said, you know, if you see this little creature, call this number. And um, that the thought was that they no longer existed. And when then the colony of them was discovered by a place called Matitsi, Wyoming. And what was interesting to me at the time was that so many people in that community knew that those creatures were out there and one of them had made the call because they knew what kind of impact that would make. Uh, and I thought that was a really good and interesting um, story about uh, the modern West and the way um, federal agencies and local people interact and you know natural resources and creatures and species. So that kind of became the very first book. Um, took a long time to get it there, but I worked on it off and on for about 10 years, and that later became the first Joe Pickett book, Open Season. Wow. Uh, I've had a, a similar conversation to that with uh, Craig Johnson. Uh, he's been on the show three times, I think, and uh, we talked about the intersection of uh, uh, of the, the traditional West with modernization and then, mm-hmm. then you have the, the intricacies of, uh, you know, uh, Native American, uh, culture and, uh, you know, just really, it, the West is still this really interesting, um, non homogenized place where, uh, the, the past and the present are, are, are still wrestling every day. Uh, and that right. seems to be a, a running theme in your books. 
and uh, and almost you know as part of the the character of place. Uh, I'm I'm really interested in 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 uh, in how place becomes a character in the book and and where people are from really manifest in the book. Is that a, uh, well, obviously it's a conscious thing with you because that was kind of the genesis of that book, but is that something that a, a thread that still runs with you when you're writing? Absolutely. Um, that's something that, you know, I always keep in mind because I think it's very real and, you know, it, it, the, you know, the, the past in the West, um, the culture is, you know, only 150 years old. So it's not, uh, it, it's still very much in every community and around the state. And in this, um, hopefully I'm not jumping ahead too much, but the juxtaposition of the new and old is very much um, present in this new book that disappeared because um, you know, very first dude and guest ranches ever were, uh, were founded in Wyoming and Montana. And it's still an industry that thrives. And it's fascinating to me that people from around the world um, – will come and stay a week on a, on a dude ranch uh, that's so unlike everything else just to kind of, uh, you know, play out this sort of cowboy um, mythos for a week and then go back to their real jobs. And there's, there's, ranches are very popular. Wow. Uh, correct me if my math is wrong, but uh, is The Disappeared the 18th Joe Pickett novel? That's correct. Exactly right. Wow. Man. Uh, where did the character of Joe Pickett come from? Um, you know, I, I didn't ever – I based him more on, re, on some real game wardens that I had met and, uh, experienced, and gone on ride-alongs with when I was a journalist. Never thought about him as a you know, detective or a cop or a Hollywood actor or something like that, but just a real game warden. And um, most of them I know and still know are very much like him. They just kind of – they love their jobs. They don't get paid much. They have very interesting experiences because um, their districts that they're in charge of are so vast. And um, they're, they're very integral into the communities that they're in, too. They're not considered, you know, outside law enforcement. They're kind of considered part of the, part of the local community. And I, I think that's a, an interesting kind of character. It, it is. It really is because uh, I, I feel the same way about uh our game wardens we don't really consider them law enforcement we think of them as you know people that are uh more interested in conservation and, and people that are working with the community uh as opposed to policing the community there's a there's a very real uh mindset difference there i think right and one of the things that i try to uh, you know convey in the books that i find in real life is that um when I go out on ride-alongs with game wardens, people just walk up to them and just start talking to them all the time, telling them stories, telling them, g g giving them tips, saying that they might have seen something somewhere that they hope the game warden will investigate. Because, they, they, you know, most people in this area are hunters and fishermen, and they really value the resource. They want it to be there the next year, too, and they don't like um, lawbreakers and poachers or people who might be taking advantage of that resource. And they look at the game warden as kind of their representative in that regard. And um, that's why game wardens often are involved in uh, crimes and investigations other than game and fish things, because they, they have a special kind of communication with the, with the local populace. And, uh, you know, in this book, Joe Pickett's sent to another part of the state, mainly because he is a game warden, and um, the governor is aware that people will just simply start talking to him and he might be able to figure out what's going on. And it, he makes for a really interesting uh, protagonist uh, because I think before Joe Pickett, I'd never really thought of a game warden in that way. Uh, but, you know, a, a lot of times we've got recurring characters in, in mystery thrillers and uh, they'll have, you know, very uh, maybe – Maybe a sheriff like Walt Longmire, like uh, like you know mm -hmm. Craig Wrights, or maybe you know a, a a CIA agent or someone that that you think is is uh, particularly skilled for this kind of work. Uh, but Joe really, and, and I, I love that you the way you've broken it down is because he he's the perfect character to solve these kinds of mysteries. Um, when did you know that uh, that you were on to something with Joe? Well, I think it, I mean after the first book. Um... When, uh, you, know, you know, it took a long time to write it, took a long time to um, get an agent, took a long time to find a publisher. 
but when it when it was finally published in 2001, um, the reception for it was um, exactly everything that wasn't supposed to happen, and that it was a, a New York Times notable book, and it went into four printings, and it was really widely reviewed, and it was picked up for a movie, and it, 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 it won a bunch of awards, whole, you know, a lot of first, best first novel awards, and um, that's when I knew that uh, that a lot of these, I, I wasn't writing, I never wrote it as the first book in a series. I thought it was just a, simply a standalone story about the Endangered Species Act, basically, and the game warden was the best window to that story. But after the reception from that, um, I realized that, that, that a lot of the assumptions I'd sort of made uh, worked. You know, I didn't know if readers would like how much they would really like to read about a, a game warden with a family and not a lone wolf out on the road um, without any baggage and a state employee and um, you know, having family element in the book. But all that's what uh, people tended to respond to. So um, went from there. Um, you said that it, it took you uh, a, a good while to write that first book and, uh, you know, that it was kind of a slow process. And I think that's the, um, I think that's a similar experience for a lot of people because you, you don't know what you don't know until it all happens. And, right. uh, you, you know, and there's no, there's no one breathing down your neck there. You know, no, a lot of times nobody even knows you're writing a book, maybe, you know, a couple of close family members or friends. Um, but then once that first book is out there, uh, things change and, and all of a sudden there are schedules and, um, you have published one of these Joe Pickett novels every year since then, haven't you? Right. Yes. Once a year. Um, other than, you know, like monetary success and uh, the things that come along with having, you know, a successful book and that gets reviewed well and, and people love it. Um, how, how did those first couple of books change your life? Uh, maybe, uh, maybe creatively or in the way that you, you know, viewed your work and, and things like that? Well, you know, I wasn't able to really become a full-time writer, I think, for the first five years. Uh, we were, uh, my wife and I owned a, a tourism company, uh, an inbound tourism company, worked for several Western states, and I was writing on the side during that time. So, um, I didn't really feel much different uh, for years, first few years, other than um, I had achieved something that that I had always wanted to achieve, and that's a you know a published book, and and then several of them. But now things have kind of you know they've really taken off, and that's I guess probably the only thing I I can think of how things change is that my my daughters um, now think of me as as a, as a writer and not a guy in business, and they're sort of a, a shocked at times when their co-workers I might mention that they're reading my books and don't even know the connection um so they, at first at first they kind of thought it was weird now i think they kind of like it yeah i love that i love that uh, i'll bet that those years that you spent uh as a as a uh, uh, as a tour guide and uh and and you know, showing people the land and teaching them, uh, I, I would imagine those were really good skills that translated uh, to to your, your novel writing work. Um, Absolutely, because uh, part of what we were doing um, was it, we worked mainly internationally. So we had journalists and tour operators, travel agents would come over here from Europe primarily, and then we'd take them around Wyoming, Montana, um, South Dakota, Idaho, and by doing that, I was able to, um, you know, go on horseback trips and go skiing everywhere and um, get, go out with outfitters and do all sorts of adventures that I now write about in the Joe Pickett series without really planning that. So it wasn't strategic. It's just that I've been able to experience those things, you know, going on snowmobiles and, and getting out and about. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was also a great training ground. Um, when you're in the midst of doing that, do you ever think, oh, this would, this would make a great detail for the book? Or is it when you're sitting writing, uh, those things have been so visceral, so they're just at your fingertips to, to pull from? Well, it's both. Um, you know, at the time I was doing all that stuff, I wasn't taking notes, but then, then I, but I could, uh, recall it well enough. And now, um, this many books in, so I always try to go 
do the things that Joe Pickett is going to experience still. I'll probably get to an age where I can't, but if I write a book where, you know, he's running a whitewater canyon, I go and do that before I, before I write about it and, uh, or climb up in a, a wind turbine. You know, I try to make arrangements to do that, do those sort of things so that I can describe them, you know, with accuracy. Uh, when you're when you begin working on a new book, CJ, uh, what comes first? Does the mystery come first? Does a uh, a particular interpersonal uh, situation come up, and then uh, the mystery comes out of that? Could, what is your 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 uh, what's the process that the story starts to form for you? It's, you the, it's usually the issue that comes first. Gotcha. Because each book is um, in addition to the you know the crime mystery elements is about something that's happening, a controversy, a theme um, in Wyoming or the Mountain West. A lot of those are outdoor related, you know, um, endangered species, energy development, environmental terrorism. Um, I start with that and do the research on that and go to the place and then build the, the story around that issue. And I try not to be too over the top with um, any kind of an agenda but to um, uh, have both sides of whatever issue it is explained in the book and let the reader trust the reader to come down where they, they want to come down. Um, I think that makes the books um, current and, and um, relevant, that uh, somebody can read them, put it down, and say, geez, I didn't know that about wind energy before, or things like that. That's important to me. So so you're looking at, at something that uh, uh, that is – uh, newsworthy at the moment, and then thinking, how would this actually play out if I put this situation uh, with my characters and and then just kind of watching it unfold? Exactly. I always kind of think, how can I pull a reader through this issue in a page turning way, and and then start building it from there. Well, well, let's talk about the new uh, the new book, uh, the disappeared. What what is the What's the issue that uh, that sparked your interest with this, and how does Joe uh, find himself in the middle of it? Well, the two of them. Um, one of them is uh, the fact that uh, this um, very high-powered, well-known British woman um, PR executive has come on a, a state on a Wyoming very high-end dude ranch, and as she left the ranch, and then she never returned to England, and it's become an issue with the tabloids in the UK and therefore the governor of Wyoming is hearing about it. And he's, he sends Joe south to the Saratoga area, uh, which is South central Wyoming, where that ranch is located to try to find out um, what, what might've happened to her. So that's one. And then the other one is uh, Joe's friend, Nate Romanowski, who's an outlaw falconer uh, throughout the entire series has an issue that um, fellow falconers who have, Eagle permits um, are being denied those permits from the Fish and Wildlife Service, and uh, Nate wants Joe to try to figure out why that's happening and um, maybe try to get that reversed. So the two kind of issues, storylines, um, come together in, I hope, a unique way. Nice. Um, when when writing a series uh, for as long as you have, I, I would imagine that uh, – that some aspects of it uh, are easy to get a new a, a new book started because the uh, the world building, if you will, uh, is already in place. You're, you you've got uh, established characters and established places and um, kind of motives and and all of that, and uh, it, it's easy to get that going. Um, but what are some of the challenges of of writing a set of characters uh, for for eighteen books? Well, I, one of the challenges it's also uh, I think. Um an attribute to, of, to the series, but one of the big challenges is that they all take place in real time. Um, Joe Pickett, you know, when he was introduced um, in 2001 with his young, very young family, was uh, about 34 years old, and in each subsequent book, uh, he ages in real time, his family grows up, um, two of his three daughters have left the nest now, and so resetting it each time um, with generally about a year in between has a set of, it has a lot of challenges because um, 
I've got, got to keep track of all the characters and the family and as they mature and as they're, what are their after effects from things that happened in previous books and continue to move it forward. It'd be a lot easier if I just kept everything static, um, like some authors do. But at the right. same time, I don't think that's realistic. I, I, I don't like reading a series where, you know, 20 books in, the, the protagonist is still beating everybody up because he <laughs> never ages and never gets hurt. <laughs> Um, so th- it's, it's challenging, but I also think it keeps it fresh because uh, anybody with kids knows that it's a totally different scenario every year that they're alive. They, everybody changes and goes off in their own direction. Well, and it, it's exciting to kind of get to, to grow up with Joe Pickett, you know, as he's maturing, we're maturing as readers and, uh, I, that's, that's fantastic. I love it. Um, do you see the lines between you and, and Joe Pickett blurring the more you write him and, and you age with him? Oh, you know, I don't know. He's actually a few years younger than I am. Um, so I'm able to kind of use my experiences and from, you know, a few years ago, I think, uh, when I'm writing a current book. So I'm not sure how to answer that question because, um, yes, to some degree, things that, that I do and experience and, um, with my my family and my girls and adventures I go on, uh, Joe Pickett does as well. But I, you know, I keep a pretty I keep an arm's length relationship. <laughs> um, CJ, as a writer, uh, what makes a good mystery for you? And uh, have you ever been kind of plotting out a scenario and then realized uh, this is just not going to work? Maybe it's not engaging enough. Maybe it's uh, maybe there's not enough tension or, you know, maybe it's just not plausible. Uh, but what makes a good mystery for you? Well, I mean, for me, I, I think starting with, um, I always look for the sense of place, uh, where the, where the, the story is set. And then I think, um, I love to read other authors who really render their, their, who own their location because I like to learn about that place through them. And then I think, um, you know that I'm an outliner. Of, I start with the it, we start with the issue, and then card on a on a kind of a bullet point outline through the entire book that I hope addresses those kind of things going in. Um, sometimes I I might drop a storyline or add a new one or even change the ending when I get there. But I pretty much plot it out before I start ri- actually writing the book. So I ha- I like to think I doing storyboards and can resolve those sort of issues before I get going too far into it and, you know, suddenly look up and say, you know, this book isn't working. Uh, I, hopefully I've resolved that long before I get to that point. How long does that uh, planning and, and outlining stage take before you actually start the writing of the book? Usually at least a month, sometimes longer. Um, that's when I'm doing the research and then and, and doing the outline and trying to, and, and if it's, if the book is set in a specific place, that's not, and then I go there and um, talk to people and kind of put on my old newspaperman hat and do interviews and, and learn things. And then I start putting it point by point um, from beginning to end. Does, uh, does uh, doing the detailed outlining up front, does that make the, the daily writing when you sit down at the desk, uh, does, does it, is it much easier because each day when you sit down, you, you know what the day's task is? It, for me, it does, yes. And I, I've got lots of friends, author friends, who don't use that method. Who just they, They'll say, you know, they, they sit down and see where the characters are going to take them. But I, 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 that way I can write on days where I don't feel like it. Right. I can move the story ahead and then know I can go back later and backfill it. But at least I'm still, on, you know, in a forward motion. And I can do a very rudimentary kind of chapter and then go back and fill it in later. Well, you can tell the muse to take a hike because, uh, you know, you're you're a professional. If I I was waiting on the muse, I'd be working on book two. (laughs) That's right. That's right. Um, Well, real quick, CJ, uh, other than your Joe Pickett novels, you've got, uh, I think, five standalone books, don't you? Correct. Yeah. 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 do those uh, are are they similar place and style, uh, or, or do you use those as a to completely uh, shift gears away from Joe Pickett? I I use them to shift gears, and I set them in um, places other than Wyoming, 
and they all tend to be a little darker, um, and, uh, kind of in a um, little rougher, I think. And, but, but they also allow me to try some different things as a writer that I hope um, I can incorporate into the Joe Pickett series because I've, I've done it and I've been there. Um, you know, I've written uh, one of them was in the first person, and other ones have been very dark about a serial killer truck driver. Uh, it, it, they've all been great experiences, and they they do very well. Um, but they they kind of allow me to step out of the Joe Pickett thing, because I think um, as a reader of series, sometimes I think some writers almost get too wrapped up in their own narrative, um, and I can tell it in the book. You know, that they never try anything different. And I, I think it's, it's, it helps me. I know that. It's good to break the formula sometimes, isn't it? Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, the new book is called The Disappeared. CJ, I know you've got to go. Uh, you've got some other uh, appearances to make. Um, I absolutely love this book. I can't wait for everybody to read it. Um, I'll have my review posted on Amazon very soon. Uh, but the the, uh, the book goes live uh, Tuesday the 27th. Uh, so just a couple of days after everybody hears this interview, it's it's available for pre-order now. Go get your pre-order. And uh, CJ, it's been a great pleasure to talk to you. If people uh, want to follow you online, where can they do that? Um, uh, CJBox.net uh, has the tour on it as well as information about the book. And then I'm, I'm on Twitter and Facebook as well. Excellent. Uh, thank you for taking time to come on the show today, CJ. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleave's The Jason Crane Series. He was just seven when his parents died. Eliza received the news of their death on Halloween morning, but she kept it from Jason for two more days. She sent him out trick-or-treating. He was a vampire. He spun around in the living room, eyes wild, shouting, I am the living dead, and wondering why they didn't laugh. On November 2nd, after school, Eliza told him. His parents were dead. It was a bleak time. He wanted silence. He wanted darkness. He cried great, rolling tears. In early spring, he ran away from home which means he stole five dollars, put a box of Cheez-Its in a pillowcase, and walked seven blocks. He slept in a field, glad to be miserable. He wanted to freeze to death, to be with his mom and dad, to not feel anything. His grandmother found him at a playground near the river, fallen in the dust with his shoulder against the slope of a teeter-totter, the other end riderless, suspended. He saw her trudging up the hill. She looked twice her usual size in her winter coat, and frightening. Let's go home, Jason. He knew he was in trouble. He knew what home meant. It meant a paddling or worse. Eliza opened her big winter coat and, straining, slipped down into the dust next to him. She drew him into her warm body, wrapping him in the coat. She flipped the collar up, rubbed her hands together, and cupped them over his ears. Purr! You're an ice cube, but it feels good, kinda. It's good to get really cold sometimes. Wakes you up. They were cheek to cheek against the teeter-totter, bundled together as the sky turned from gray to orange. The ground stung, but they sat a long time. Why? The word was just a tiny puff of vapor that slipped from his lips and into the wind, but it was also big big and heavy. She knew what his little boy heart had asked. She understood the universe of longing and confusion and hurt in that one whispered word. We all die, baby. In all the long, long history of the world, there's not been one of us who didn't. I'll die, he said. It wasn't a question, but it was. Yes, and I'll die, a lot sooner, and the why is just, it's just there. It just is. We're not around to see what was before us, and we're not here to see what happens after. 
The trees on the edge of the playground shivered with dawn. But we're here now, she said, and pulled him tighter until his cheekbone felt sore from pressing against hers. And it has to be enough. It has to be. Look at all we have now. Really look. He really looked. It was just a small playground off the main road of an unimportant New England town. But in the distance he could see the wide Kennebec River, and the sky was pink above it. He saw small ships moored, trimmed in red and baby blue, rocking against the current. He saw a robin on the railing of a dock, toes pointed inward, making occasional hops that were also flight. The town was waking up. There was a light in the bakery and one in the grocery. There was an empty can of beer on a picnic table and wildflowers by the road. There was wind and trees swaying gently. There was his own breath in his own lungs. There was his grandmother, her body, her heartbeat against his back as he leaned against her chest. There was his own life and hers and a world to live them in. And it was enough.